Hello, my name is Zara Fleming and I'm an Art Society lecturer and I focus mainly on the Buddhist art and culture of Tibet, Bhutan and the Himalayas. And I've also been taking treks and tours to this part of the world for over 40 years. So it's a subject that I'm passionate about and I love sharing it with Art Society members wherever you may be. At home in the UK, internationally, Australia or even taking some of you on my trips to the Himalayas. But at the moment, I can't speak to you in person, and nor can we travel safely. So I'm stuck here at home in beautiful North Wales, surrounded by the hills and the sheep. So I thought I'd take this opportunity of telling you a little bit about my early history and introducing you to a few of my objects. But in order to do that, I think we better go inside. Well, I'm now back inside and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my early history. People often ask me why I became interested in Tibet and the Himalayas. Well, it was actually quite a long time ago. It was March 1959 and I had a teacher who told our class about the Chinese communist invasion of Tibet and the flight of the Dalai Lama and thousands and thousands of Tibetans into exile. And our school then raised money for Tibetan refugees, particularly Tibetan children. And I don't think we raised that much, but a seed was sown. And ever after, I became fascinated by this country on the roof of the world. During my teens, I read various books. I remember finding Heinrich Harrer's Seven Years in Tibet on my parents' bookshelf. But I don't remember reading anything about art. But at that time, I was really more interested in Western art because I went on to study history of art um, at the Courtauld under the now infamous Anthony Blunt. But always at the back of my mind was a desire to go to Tibet. But it was firmly closed at that time because it was during the Cultural Revolution. So when time and money permitted, I decided to travel overland to Nepal, a very memorable journey. But arriving in the Kathmandu Valley was magical. Uh, it's ringed around by snowy mountains and green paddy fields, and the city itself is like an open-air museum. Wherever you go, you stumble into, you know, the wonderful Hindu pagoda temples, many of which were destroyed during the 2015 earthquake, at, but also very early Buddhist sites like this chaitya and stupa here that date from the 5th century. Now, Nepal is predominantly a Hindu country, but Buddhism has always been highly respected here because the historical Buddha, Sakyamuni, was born on the borders of what is today India and Nepal. But the other thing important for me about the Kathmandu Valley was at that time there were many, many Tibetans who had come to live here, who'd escaped over the Himalayas to freedom. Many at that time in refugee camps, where I helped out. And I befriended one particular family, and the wife's husband had been killed crossing the Himalayas. And I went on to try and help the daughter. And in recognition, uh, in gratitude really, she gave me my first Tibetan object, which is very simple. It's nothing special, but it's special to me because it brings back memories. It's made of the knot or burl of a birch tree, highly polished, and it's inlaid with silver because they believe that silver negates any impurities. And it also has a silver base with very faint incisions of the eight auspicious emblems and a lotus foot. Now this is used for drinking tea. And the Tibetans drink up to 40 cups a day. And their tea is mixed with butter and salt. So it's definitely an acquired taste. And the other important thing to remember is that Tibet is essentially a nomadic country. So everything has to be very light and very portable so that they can carry it. Like my next object, which is this wooden container for Tsampa. Now, tsampa is roasted barley flour 
which they mix with their tea into a porridge-like consistency. And this is really the staple diet of many Tibetans. But what's important about this is that it's ornamented or painted all the way around with the lotus, which is a symbol of purity and also of enlightenment. And actually what I've always found is that however mundane the object, whether it be a food container or a tea bowl, it's always ornamented in some way with a Buddhist symbol, so that the people are ever mindful of their faith. Now my third object is this block of wood. I saw it being sold by an elderly Tibetan. I love the look of it, I love the feel of it, and I was intrigued because it's carved on all four sides. And I then discovered it's something called a zampa, which means a wooden mould or a parshing, a food mould. And it's used to create miniature effigies out of dough to be used as scapegoat offerings to give to the deities or to propitiate evil spirits. So what do I actually mean about that? Well, if you think back to early times of the Tibetan kings or the Chinese emperors, when they were buried, they were buried not just by themselves, but they were buried with their servants, with their retainers and with their possessions. Now, when Buddhism came into Tibet in the 7th century, to kill anything was complete anathema. So they invented a form of non-violent offering, which they call torma. So these are used to create miniature torma. First, they coat it with butter. And then with dough, they press it into the incisions. And when it's dried, they take it out. And they either affix it to a larger torma, or it's laid on the altar as the monk or lama dictates. And sometimes they're used on household shrines because they're very important in healing rituals. Now my zampa is carved, as I said, on all four sides. Uh, the first side depicts seven insects, and then you have the eight auspicious Buddhist emblems, and then five motifs for the elements. The next side depicts the Tibetan astrological system, and this shows 12 animals. Now these don't represent the months, they represent the year, and this is based on the lunar calendar. The third side depicts many different birds, and also ritual instruments, the sort of things you find that being used in monasteries. And the fourth side, on the left, it shows a healing prayer or mantra, and on the right, an assembly of weapons, which will be used as an offering to the deities. So it's a very intriguing thing. And what I love about it, I think, is because you have so many Buddhist motifs, which you can hold in the palm of your hand. Now I then travelled on through Asia and I then worked in Australia to earn my package back to the UK. And I was very lucky because I managed to get a job in the V&A Museum. And I worked in the Indian department, or what was then called the Indian department, and mainly with their Buddhist collections. And this was a wonderful opportunity to learn much more about Buddhist art and culture. And after working there for quite a number of years, I got the opportunity to have extended leave to go to different parts of the Himalayas that had only just opened up. And these included Ladakh and Bhutan. Now, Ladakh is a high altitude desert, once part of Tibet, then a kingdom in its own right, and today part of India. But it's very like Tibet once was, and full of monasteries. And here you can see two monks blowing the long horns, which we call Dumche, to call the faithful to prayer. And these are also portable objects, as you can see here. So they are very a useful instrument. Also in Ladakh, I bought this little shrine box. Now, these are carried when you're traveling to protect you on your journey and to bring you luck, but they're also placed on the altar 
of a household shrine to bring you many blessings. Now, they normally come in two parts. This is actually fixed and it's in a fabric traveling case. It's made of copper and with a silver front. And on the front are the eight auspicious Buddhist emblems with what we call the triple jewel of Buddhism at the top and the face of glory at the bottom. Now, inside is a tiny clay plaque called a tzata. It's painted and it represents Sakyamuni Buddha. And the, whatever you carry inside your gao normally is dictated by your lama or spiritual guide, depending on your meditational practice. After the Dak, I travelled through northern India to the kingdom of Bhutan, an incredibly beautiful country, scenically very different from Ladakh, in that at least 70% of the land is forested, but otherwise similar because it is steeped in their Buddhist faith. And here is Taksang Lakhang, or Tiger's Nest, a very important pilgrimage place from the 8th century onwards. And important for me also, for a more mundane reason, but it was where I got engaged to my husband. And we went back about five years ago uh, to celebrate our 40th anniversary. And by the way, he's British and not Bhutanese. Now, my objects from Bhutan at that time are this very simple uh, cane basket called a bata, which is used for carrying all sorts of things in, portable, very light. And in, for instance, something like taking lunch out to people working in the fields is one very common use for this. Here we have a woven woolen textile from Bumtang in central Bhutan called a yata and it's woven from the underbelly hair of the yak which is softer. It is watertight and it is also incredibly warm. And here we have a white porcelain figure of a deity called Green Tara. You might be saying, well, she's not very green, but she's only white because of the porcelain. Now, she represents active compassion and generosity. Her right leg is pendant on a lotus, as though she's about to leap up to help all sentient beings with her compassion. And her right hand, with the palm uppermost, is in what we call the Virada Mudra, which is the act of generosity. Now, with Buddhist deities, you don't worship them. What you do is meditate and visualise on their qualities, which in this case is compassion and generosity. So the idea is to generate these positive emotions and bring them into your daily life. She's very beautiful with a serene face and in her left hand is the lotus of purity. But she's very unusual being made of porcelain because most Buddhist deities are made of clay, of wood, or particularly of metal. So uh, this porcelain one was made in the 1970s by a Bhutanese craftsman who was instructed in the art of porcelain making by a very famous Indian ceramicist uh, called Gauri Kozla. And it then died out as a fashion, but it is now being revived as part of their very extensive uh, Bhutanese arts and crafts repertoire. Now, I still, at this point, hadn't been to Tibet, but the Cultural Revolution was now over. And imagine my delight when, in 1981, Thomas Cook asked me to take the first group to Tibet. But there was a slight problem. You still couldn't go in as tourists. And so I was told we had to go in posing as mountaineers. Now, I'm definitely no mountaineer. And when I met the group at Hoothrow, mountaineers is not a word I would use to describe them. Most were very elderly, and most would have been far better with a Zimmer frame or a walking stick than wielding an ice axe. Anyway, they were determined. So we went to, we flew to Beijing, and we were met by our hosts, the Chinese Mountaineering Association. But as we staggered off the plane with our bags emblazoned with Mount Everest Tibet Expedition 1981, 
I think they were somewhat startled, but I tried to convince them that what we were were actually retired mountaineers, but I don't think they believed a word of it. Anyway, arriving in Tibet for me was very emotional. The scenery is magnificent, the blue skies, the snowy mountains, but of course it wasn't the same Tibet of pre-1950. It was a very different place now under the Chinese communist regime and so much destruction had been caused by the Cultural Revolution. But we were lucky in many ways because there were very, well there were no other tourists. So we were able to visit the few sites that were open, like the Patala Palace, which was originally, the red part houses a 7th century palace, but then it, the whole thing was extended and built as it is today by the 5th Dalai Lama in the 17th century. And it was the seat of government and winter abode of the Dalai Lamas until 1959. It's incredible. It's a thousand rooms, a mile in circumference and 13 floors. And the young Dalai Lama, the present Dalai Lama, arrived here when he was four. And he has often spoken about how he used to go up onto the roof as a child and gaze down to the streets below. And in his early teens, he got a telescope so he could see much better what was going on. But I think he gazed rather longingly at children playing in the streets below and flying kites. Anyway, we travelled on via Gyantse. Gyantse Dzong was familiar to me because I'd read so much about it because the British Young Husband Expedition, well, it wasn't really an expedition, it was a um, military uh, uh, mission, sacked the fort of Gyantse in July 1904. And many of the objects in the V&A uh, were brought back by British soldiers on this expedition. And Gansi itself is a wonderful town. It used to be the third largest town in Tibet. But it houses what we call the Gansi Kumbum, built in the design of a mandala. And we couldn't go in at this time, but if you ever can, it contains the most beautiful 15th century murals and sculptures. And then we travelled on in a vehicle like this uh, to, and eventually arrived at the Rongbuk Monastery, which is just below Everest Base Camp. And I'm incredibly proud of my group uh, that we all arrived here in one piece and that, you know, they made it despite being elderly and somewhat frail, but they were made of that very strong, determined British spirit. And today you can go out no longer on dirt tracks. There is a proper road snaking out into Nepal. But I think when you look at this landscape, it always impresses me how vibrant and how colourful and how sophisticated a lot of the Tibetan art is. I am now going to describe the painting behind me, which you have been looking at. It's what we call a tanker, which literally means something that can be rolled up and is portable, like a portable scroll. They're made of a sized cotton canvas and painted in gouache, and then mounted in a brocade uh, surround. And this one is a technique known as martang, and it's late 18th century. And what martang really means is that it has a red background, and then it's painted in gold ink or gold leaf. What it represents is what we call the 35 confessional Buddhas. And in monasteries and nunneries at the end of every month they do a special meditation on these Buddhas. They visualize each Buddha in turn and many of them have different hand gestures or mudras and they chant the appropriate prayer or mantra. Now those of you who have attended my lectures will remember that when you actually create a Tibetan tanka, it is a spiritual tool for meditational purposes. So it has to be very carefully, you have to follow the Buddhist text as to what it looks like, as to the iconometry or the mathematical proportions, and the iconography, 
whether the figure is seated or standing, and what hand gestures or attributes they have. So the monks will be visualising that for each of these figures, and it's a way for them to atone for any sins they've done in the last month, or really to take stock of that period of time. And because they're used in meditation, they quite often have a brocade square down the bottom. It's rather like the door that you enter to go into a different world, in this case, a world of meditation. And sometimes, but not in this example, they have a little square brocade uh, insert at the top as a way out. Um, but this one has no, no way out. But it is a very beautiful piece that was given to me by a friend whose collection I catalogued, who sadly died uh, last year. Now my next painting is what we call a mandala, a circular diagram representing the cosmos or the universe, and also a celestial palace of a deity, which in this case is something called Kala Chakra, who is seen in the centre of the mandala, but as symbols, he is himself and his consort. So a mandala literally means container of essence. So hence the deity right in the centre. He is the sacred and essence in the centre. Now you find mandalas in many cultures. You find them amongst the Navajo Indians, you find that Jung used them as psychoanalytical tools, and even our stained glass rose windows in our cathedrals are types of mandalas, but they're most commonly associated with Asia, and in particular the Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain cultures. But I think it's in Tibet, or in Tibetan art, that they have reached one of their most sophisticated. And my, also you find very beautiful examples from the Japanese Buddhists. So what exactly is this for? Well, it is really for an initiation ritual. The Lama will instruct the student on how to move from the outer world of samsara, which in this case is ringed around by flames, which represent the flames of ignorance, to go through the different stages of meditation and finally to reach the centre which is the state of perfection. So in a sense, it's really like transforming yourself, transforming your mind, getting to know the real you, if you like. And it is a very important Buddhist practice, but you have to be initiated into it. Now, I saw a young boy painting this. He was only about 14, and his father was the real artist. And so I asked if I could buy it when he'd finished it. And I went back a couple of weeks later, he was in the Kathmandu Valley, and I purchased it. So it's, it's not a beautiful one, but it is, again, it brings back memories to me. Now, every couple of years, uh, we invite a group of Tibetan monks to North Wales to come and stay for a few days. And they perform sacred dance called Cham on in our garden dressed in brocade costumes and masks and this is part of what we call our Tibet day it's really like a glorified fate and many people from the surrounding area come and watch and these dances are accompanied by sacred music you can see here the monks blowing the long horns or long trumpets called Dunchen that we saw earlier but what is also important is they create a small mandala, but not painted. It's made out of sand. So mandalas can be 3D, like the stupa we saw at Gyantse, or they can be painted, or they can be made of sand. But it's not real sand. This is actually crushed marble, which is painted by monks in the monastery. And originally, in olden times, it would have been made for cru from crushed gems, so it must have looked spectacular. Now here we have one monk who is actually starting off the mandala, and he's tapping sand out of a copper funnel. And to create a mandala is in fact an act of meditation. And normally there are four monks around, each doing a little bit. 
And this mandala is for peace and harmony in the world. It only takes them a couple of days to make, but you can see that the finished example is very beautiful with offerings all the way around the side. Now, after the mandala has been created, it has to be ritually dismantled or destroyed because they deliver the sound back to the elements. So here we normally put it in a river or in the garden, but it always has to go back to its original source because in Buddhism really nothing is permanent. But I want to show you this really more sophisticated mandala here, which was made in the House of Commons in 2008 for a visit by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And this represents the mandala of compassion or Chen Rezi of whom the Dalai Lama is an emanation. And it is, as you can see, beautiful, all made out of coloured sand and is in the centre is the lotus, symbol of compassion. And after this has been created, it was then tipped into the Thames. And when you're tipping it into the water, it really is something of benefit for all sentient beings. Now, the objects I have shown you today are probably nothing particularly special, but they're very special to me because they bring back memories of people, places and things that I have encountered in my life. And I feel incredibly blessed to have come across this culture, which you find right the way across the Himalayas, which is so uh, steeped in their Buddhist faith. And I hope a little bit of it might have rubbed off on me, or maybe one day. Uh, but thank you very much for listening, and I hope that very much in the future we will be able to meet and I can tell you a little bit more about Himalayan art and culture. Thank you. And as they say in Tibet, Tashi Dele.